Hey mushroom nerds, it's Anna McHugh. I'm kicking off my 2023 wild mushroom season with this beautiful specimen of the blusher. Uh, the best thing to do scientifically would be to call this Amanita amerorubescens species group. And so uh, when I say species group, what I mean is that we have several species in the eastern United States that have uh, sort of similar characteristics, but they are distinct species. And so the best thing to do is refer to them as a species group. Some of them are sort of undefined and provisional naming is going on. So you have a lot of sort of emergent science happening around uh, these extraordinarily common mushrooms. Okay, so let's talk about identification. First of all, uh, for this mushroom specifically, because it is an edible mushroom, you may wish to know, and it is super duper common. And so, you know, when it comes to acquiring enough experience to feel comfortable identifying it, the blusher is a pretty good choice. Secondly, because I wanna talk about the Amanita genus in general, if you are new to mushroom hunting, sort of one of your first tasks is to learn to identify the Amanita genus. And the reason for that is largely safety. So some of our most um, you know, poisonous and toxic mushrooms are in the Amanita genus. So I'll outline the features that they share so you can kind of get your head around it. But there are a lot of Amanitas, not all of them are toxic. Many of them are edible, um, including this one. So uh, let's talk about uh, the blusher more specifically and how to identify it. So first of all, no, actually, okay, let's back it up and talk about the morphology of an Amanita mushroom. You can tell I haven't made a video in a few months because I am very disorganized and I have no idea what I'm going to talk about. But all right, let's uh, let's do the Amanita, uh, you know, parts uh, first. So when you're collecting mushrooms, you have a couple of different lifestyles. You really want to hone in on what it is that the mushrooms uh, mycelium or the real fungal body is feeding upon. And so uh, a lot of mushrooms that grow on wood, for instance, are decomposers. And their whole role is to take dead organic material and they uh, digest it and suck it into the fungal network. Uh, we also have parasitic mushrooms, a lot of, you know, sort of cryptic lifestyles going on. But we also have mushrooms that are very commonly sort of on the forest floor and a lot of the very, uh, you know, prized edible mushrooms are mycorrhizal species. And mycorrhizal simply means root fungus. And so the lifestyle is that it partners with a tree or plant and, uh, you know, the fungus can't make its own sugars. And so it has to be fed by something. And so uh, in the case of a mycorrhizal relationship, uh, the plant or tree will supply photosynthetic sugars to the fungus and the fungus in return supplies um, a lot in the way of moisture and then minerals and other things that uh, are very helpful and beneficial to the tree. And so in the case of the Amanita genus, you have these uh, mycorrhizal mushrooms that grow in association again with different trees. And that's really also why uh, you find a mushroom patch and it persists year after year as you're visiting a, uh, an organism that has a long-standing relationship with a tree or plant and it only fruits and makes mushrooms at certain times of year and certain, you know, weather conditions. So in the case of North Carolina, it's like it's starting to get warm, we're starting to get rain, summertime is on its way, that can be kind of gross, but also it is mushroom time. So my ambivalence tips toward enjoying summertime, at least, uh, you know, in the American South. All right, so you have, uh, you know, Amanita mushrooms. They grow, uh, again, as a root fungus in association and a, a symbiotic relationship with their partner. In the case of uh, Amanita amerorubescens and the, you know, the different uh, blushers, you'll see them growing with, uh, you know, oak primarily. So I am actually sitting at the base of a willow oak tree. Um, let me see, I think I had a couple of leaves here to show you. I seem to have misplaced them, like the fresh ones. But basically it's an oak tree that unlike a lot of oaks that have like lobes and, and uh, you know, fingers and points, uh, a willow oak basically is a big old honking oak tree that has uh, leaves that are really simple and look like a willow leaf. So anyway, you know, you'll find these mushrooms growing at the base of trees uh, during certain weather conditions. Amanitas don't all grow with oak. They're, you know, they associate with pine. There's a lot of, um, you know, highly specific and specialized relationships between uh, different mushrooms and their trees and the things that they like. So that's another thing that I love about mushroom hunting is uh, 
observing and forming an understanding of the relationship between different, uh, you know, fungal networks and, uh, and their symbiotic mycorrhizal partners. So uh, in the case of um, Amanitas, what you have is a, a really classic cap and stem mushroom, typically. And uh, if you look underneath, and this is a really beautiful specimen for a couple of reasons, but if you look underneath uh, the cap of an Amanita mushroom, you're gonna see these, uh, you know, structures here. Us mushroom people call them gills. So in the case of many, many Amanita mushrooms, the gills are white in color, as are the spores. I say many because there are some Amanita mushrooms that have different colored gills. So there are some that have sort of yellowy gills, some with creamy gills. But in the case of a lot of your Amanita mushrooms, if you flip them over, you have uh, white gills underneath. You also, uh, in many cases, uh, have this beautiful feature here called a partial veil. And as you can see, it's just basically, you know, let me reposition a little bit. So you can see it's just basically a thin layer of protective tissue that covers up the mushroom's gills. And that just, again, protects the uh, gills while they mature. And when, um, you know, the mushroom is fully mature, this partial veil will break. I'm gonna see if I can do it artificially in a minute. I'm not gonna do that quite yet, just in case I screw up this video and try to start over. Uh, but, you know, when the partial veil uh, ruptures as the mushroom sort of expands and this, this cap edge gets too big for the little uh, protective tissue, it will oftentimes break and leave a ring on the stem. So you have uh, often white gills, often a ring on the stem, but the main thing that's really important about Amanita mushrooms is the base of the stem. And in the case of the blusher, this isn't a, a like super distinctive base, like some Amanitas, they have really, really uh, unique and interesting features at the base. But one way or the other, Amanita mushrooms, they emerge from what's called a universal veil. So we're just talking about a partial veil. A universal veil is a protective, uh, you know, protective tissue that uh, surrounds the entirety of the baby mushroom when it is little. And then um, as it matures, it will break open. And, you know, that's not necessarily like a mushroom egg. Some of them do form in eggs, but a lot of times it's more like there's protective tissue that's really powdery and very ephemeral. In the case of Amanita amara rubescens group, really all you have is a bit of, um, you know, a bulbous base, oftentimes with a little bit of a point at the end. Uh, and so in the case of, you know, this mushroom and a lot of its uh, relatives in the same species section, so like, with Amanita, there's so many of them, and they're also very well studied that uh, it's oftentimes really helpful to uh, study sort of one level above the, uh, the species level. So you have Amanita is broken up into different species sections. This one belongs to section Valley Day, and a lot of these mushrooms, unlike other Amanitas, don't have big lumpy bulbous bases, they don't have uh, cups of tissue at the base, but a lot of your Amanita mushrooms do. Uh, however, you know, in the case of Valley Day mushrooms, um, you know, not all of them, but certainly the Amara rubescens group, you have just basically a bit of a bulb and it's not super distinctive uh, and, a, and a bit of a tapering point here. Um, and this is a really good reason that when you are collecting mushrooms and you want to get help identifying them, uh, you should collect the entirety of the specimen. So pick the whole mushroom. I have uh, a suggestion as far as that's concerned. So this is my trusty mushroom knife. It is super good for a couple of reasons. Um, eh. All right, so you can see I have a nice sort of hook shaped knife. So that makes it really easy to pop them up from the base. And then I, it has a handy dandy brush on the other side. So I can just clean it up and, you know, uh, scratch that itch uh, that I had as a child to become a paleontologist. Uh, mushrooms, as it turns out, are a lot more common than dinosaur bones, and so I get to use um, a detail brush on them. So, you know, you want to collect the entirety of the specimen because the stem base is really important to identifying any Amanita mushroom and also distinguishing an Amanita mushroom from other mushrooms that have some similar looks. So, you know, don't fret if you have to collect the whole mushroom that is going to be necessary to, uh, you know, positively identify it. So, 
Your Amanitas also, other common things that you will see with them is uh, these little warts on them. Um, and that is also part of that universal veil tissue I was talking about. And as it breaks, um, you end up with oftentimes these kind of cool concentric zones of wartiness. And if you touch them and mess with them a little bit, oftentimes they'll flake right off. And you know, sometimes those are big warts and chunky, but oftentimes they're really like this, this close little pattern. And sometimes it can almost look scaly. Uh, certainly in this case, like the, the, uh, you know, the warts are not very tall. Okay. So we've talked about, uh, Amanitas in general. Um, and again, the reason to get to recognize them is first of all, they're very common. It's a really fruitful, pun not intended area for, uh, you know, studying and getting to know mushrooms and observing them because we have so very many of them and a lot of them are super duper colorful or have these really, uh, you know, very striking features. But also, again, for safety reasons because um, Amanita bisporigera and other Amanitas that are known as destroying angels are in the genus. Uh, destroying angel is an apt common name because it is a very, very dangerous mushroom and extraordinarily common also in the North Carolina Piedmont. We also have Amanita phylloides, the so-called death cap mushroom, and that is similarly very poisonous. I, uh, you know, it is very rarely observed in North Carolina, but anyway, it is, it's important to know. Um, and, you know, finally, it's really fun to start to tease apart these different uh, sections of the Amanita genus, because as we study them and understand them better, the uh, sort of radical differences between their features really starts to make a little bit more sense. Okay, so I talked, talked your ear off about Amanitas and why you should love them and collect them and maybe not ever eat them if you don't feel comfortable. Like there's no pressure in this world to ever eat a blushing mushroom uh, if you are not so inclined. But uh, nonetheless, it's a delightful genus. And, and again, because they're so ubiquitous, it's a really good area to, to get to know. When it comes to blushers, uh, overall so let's go over the identification features really quickly i've kind of covered them to one degree or another but i'll get slightly more specific so first of all we have a cap and stem mushroom doesn't always have warts but sometimes has warts and it's very very typically sort of this light brownish color sometimes it tends a little more in the yellowish direction um and sometimes it's more pale so i find uh, you know, these mushrooms and they're really sort of like the color of a white button mushroom, like there's not much to them. But the one thing that all blushers share is this really attractive uh, sort of reddish blushing uh, or staining reaction. And it looks a lot like a red wine spill or something like that. It's kind of a darkish red mahogany. And you'll see it, um, you know, not always like a beautiful uh, patch of it on the top of the cap. More frequently or really commonly, let me see, where is it? Okay, so you'll see little streaks and, and bits of it uh, sort of around the margin of the cap. Uh, and then additionally at the base of the mushroom, again, you don't have like a huge bulbous stem base. You just have a bit of enlargement here with a, a little bit of a point, not always, but often, but you do have this uh, sort of dark reddish color that uh, is a stain that you will see, you know, and it's really quite distinctive, um, especially, you know, I've been damaging and handling this and it has gotten more and more stained as time has gone on in the course of the afternoon. Um, another thing that you'll see, and not on this specific specimen, oh, actually, the beginnings of one. So really often I find these little pits and holes in the base of Amanita merirubescens, and sometimes a little roly-poly bug will pop out of it. So, you know, they are uh, popular with bugs, as many mushrooms are. Uh, but, you know, those are the, the features that uh, tell me what I have. And then, of course, we have this uh, partial veil. Now I'm going to see if I can make it turn into a ring on the stem. The name for this feature is, uh, besides ring, is annulus. So uh, that is what you will read in certain mushroom field guides and identifications that people have if they are being... Um, more technical. This went terribly. Okay, so I damaged the uh, partial veil. We 
Some of it has clung actually, like right here is sort of where you would see um, the, you know, ring form. But in the case of this mushroom, you can see also that it is a really uh, sort of fragile and thin ring. Let me see if I can also get a slightly better uh, focus on the texture of it itself. Um, let me see, okay. You can see it's kind of felty on the inside and a little st actually striated and sort of streaky on the outside. It's really faint and kind of hard to observe. Let me, let me again, super out of practice with this. Well, maybe you'll be able to see it. I can't see whether or not you can see it, but it has basically these really fine little lines. It almost looks like, uh, you know, micro corduroy or something like that. And then uh, this is a thing that I that I really love about the uh, partial veils of Amanita amara rubescens is that you oftentimes have just this little uh, sort of perimeter or the very edge has this really, really dark brown color. And I particularly like that because it, it just looks like, uh, you know, the trim on a nice uh, flared skirt because that's kind of what it can look like when, uh, you know, the mushroom actually has the uh, partial veil veil, you know, on the, on the stem. All right, there we go. Okay. So we've beheaded the, we've, we've beheaded the mushroom, but you could see it would hang down quite a distance and it is very, very uh, fragile and can very easily fall off. That's another thing with collecting mushrooms. You always want to just be mindful that uh, the features can vary, uh, specimen to specimen, but also the effects of aging, bugs, and other factors like how much sun hits the mushroom can make a difference as to its appearance. And uh, things like rings on the stem falling off is a super duper common thing. Fortunately, most mushroom field guides are like, eh, it has a ring on the stem. If it has a ring on the stem for you. Uh, so anyway, um, as far as the gills are concerned, you can see they're really quite white. And we also have a stem here that is uh, like very uh, closely attached. And so sometimes the gills are uh, totally separate. Like you'll have a really clear separation between gills and stem. And sometimes in the case of Amara rubescens, uh, you'll have, I think it's called adnext. So it's like, oh, let's see if it's actually, yeah, it is actually attached, but just barely attached. It's kind of like notched and barely attached to the, um, to the, the gills, like the connection point between the gills and the stem. The other thing that you'll note as this mushroom matures, and you can start to see it ever so faintly, is almost like some of the pinky, uh, you know, reddish coloration starts to move into the gill area. But again, primarily you're gonna see it as streaks on the cap, uh, and sort of this dark reddish color, and then also very much at uh, your base of the stem. This one is completely subsumed by the mahogany, and that's not always the case. Like oftentimes it is uh, like streaks of red, but it is really a pretty substantial amount of coloration. So uh, that is Amanita amara rubescent species group. I clearly can't reshoot this uh, mushroom video, so hopefully my 2023 video making season is off to a start. I hope you find a billion mushrooms and we will catch you later.